Thank you, Rocky. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for inviting me this evening. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Winfield State Hospital as well. Um, early in my career, I worked at Winfield State Hospital. Um, it, it, it was a big part of my career. I learned a lot from it. Um, I'm probably not going to be quite as kind as Bill was about it. Um, you know, there's a cemetery at Winfield State Hospital, and I was uh, looking on the web, and I found a website that list, it listed everybody who's buried there. Uh, the first person buried there in that cemetery, her name was uh, Minnie Dow. She was born in 1871. She died in 1911 at the age of 40. There were 750 other people buried there, people who, whose li lived lives isolated from family and the community. And why was that? It was because there was not a place for them in the community. The only place that was deemed appropriate for them was a place away from the community, Winfield State Hospital. State officials at the time said and, and, and legislated that the state had a duty to provide such a place. Bernard, I want to congratulate you for the courage that you've had, not just <clears throat> moving from that facility, Willowbrook, because I think that was natural once you were able to do that. But the courage to tell your story to others around the country. It's, it's an important story, and we all need to hear it over and over again. Thirty years ago, when I worked at Winfield State Hospital, it was routine for us to receive babies days after birth, babies with very severe disabilities whose doctors had told the families, give up your child. You won't be able to take care of that child. They need to go to the institution, and to the institution they came. And you know, 30 years ago, there really wasn't such a thing as early childhood intervention in the community. Parents didn't have a choice. Many of these babies had disabilities so severe that they were not expected to live. The babies lived on wards in a setting that was like being in a hospital, perpetually. They lived in large rooms. They were tiled. They lived in cribs, steel cribs that looked more like cages than cribs. There were about 15 of these cribs into a large open room. Very little human interaction for the babies with the staff because there were never enough staff. The human interaction happened during feeding, bathing, diapering, other times they were strapped in wheelchairs and put in front of TVs that they couldn't understand what was going on. During my employment, new federal funds were available where we were able to begin early intervention education programs for the infant and preschool age children at the state institution. I remember that our preschool classrooms were set up in rooms in the hospital building that were formerly surgical rooms. The infant stimulation room was set up in a room that used to be the morgue. I thought it was ironic that we were teaching skills to children in rooms that generations before used to be used for routine sterilization of the residents. The adults also lived on wards. They slept in big rooms lined with rows of beds. Up to 20 people would sleep together with portable partitions between the beds. During the day, they would be in a big open room. 
not much in the room, hard plastic furniture, a big TV blaring on the wall, again, nobody could understand. The rooms were locked. They didn't have freedom of access around the institution. They were escorted to therapy, escorted to meals, escorted maybe sometimes to activities off campus, but that was pretty rare. That's what I recollect of Winfield. Um, today, what we expect for people with disabilities in the community doesn't even relate to the things that we did back then. And the things that happened back then were the best that people thought to do. It was wrong, but it was there, it was the best. People were doing the best that they knew how. And we always, in, 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 in that kind of a setting, you, you, you create this idea that people have certain needs of care. And what that does, though, it never allows people to experience risk. And we all know that's how we grow. We risk. We experience new things in our lives, new things that sometimes we fail. But from failure, we learn, and we go on to the next thing. And we call that the dignity of risk. That was never available to people in the institution. I used to see people in the institution, what they learned was learned helplessness. And I work for an organization named Catch. We are a community service provider in Wichita, Kansas. We were started by parents who had children with developmental disabilities in the early 1960s. And these parents wanted a different option than the institution. They felt like if something was available in the community to teach their children how to work, that they could work. They could become employed. They could live regular lives in the community. That's what we were founded on. Um, today, we expect people to have choice. We expect people to be able to live in their own home. We expect them to be able to live with whom they want to live. We expect them to, if they want to work, to be able to work. Or if they don't want to work, to be involved in other activities in the community. And we're there to help support that, to facilitate that for them and provide what's needed for them to achieve their goals. Some people don't need a lot. They come to us, they have a specific dream, we provide some services, they achieve that dream, they're on their own. I can think of many people that we've served that have come to us from state institutions that we don't even work with anymore. They're on their own. Other people need a lot of support and they will always need a lot of support and we always need to be there for them, but not to smother them just to support them to the extent that they want us there in their lives supporting them. I will close by saying that it was mentioned earlier by speakers, there is a bill, House Bill 2761, that I hope you will all pay attention to, talk to your legislators about right now the commu community programs are really kind of at a crossroads. We have two problems. One is we have several thousand people waiting for services. That's unacceptable. People need their support to be successful in the community. You can't wait for it. If you wait for it, you lose. You lose what skills you may have learned at school. Or you may learn, you may be in jeopardy of losing your current living situation. You can't wait. 2761 would fund the waiting list for all waiver services, all people with disabilities. The other problem that we have that was mentioned earlier 
the people that we employ to provide the support services to people with disabilities on average make eight and a half dollars an hour. That is not a living wage. The people who love their job, they love working with people with disabilities, they're wonderful at doing it, they can't afford to keep doing it. And they're leaving at alarming numbers. At my organization last year, our turnover of staff working with our clients was 60 percent. You can't maintain integrity of your services with that high of turnover. They need to have a living wage. 2761 would provide rate increases to get our direct care wages equal to the entry wage of staff at a state in the state institutions, which is $12.05 an hour. Thank you.